So let's talk a little bit about definitive stamps. Um, here in on, uh, okay, I'll have another handout here in a second. So on these definitive stamps, um, again, we talked about uh, all stamps until 1929 had a king or coat of arms. So you can see, you know, five of the six stamps up there are uh, coats are kings, mm -hmm. basically. Um, some were overprinted, like that 50 cent there and uh, that purple one and 50 cent. And that was done, there's a whole series of Italian stamps that were overprinted, and that was done uh, due to a lack of denominations, not necessarily a change in postal rates. So the postal rates didn't necessarily change, but they were running out of stamps. And uh, so they would take old stocks and overprint them to create the denominations they needed. Uh, on, the, on the right, there's a definitive with an advertising label. Those are some of the hardest and most expensive <coughs> early Italian stamps to collect. I think I have three of them hmm. out of, I don't know, 18 or something like that. What year is that? Uh, that is 1924. Uh, there were 19 of them total. Um, one, a couple were not issued. I've seen them for sale before and they go for big money. Um, but... So it was intended, if you look at the stamp, there's no perforations between the label and the upper stamp. And they, it was intended that the label should be separated, but it didn't get printed that way. And so the stamps were only valid internally in the country. And because the UPU at the time banned the use of advertisement of stamps for overseas mail. So if you were sending something out of the country, it was a violation of the UPU to have advertising on a stamp. So, so, so you know how New Zealand got around that? No, I don't. They printed it on the back of the stamp. Back of the stamp. And I've seen stamps with stuff on the back. Absolutely. So the Scots list that? Yes, they do. It does, it does list those. It should be in 1924. Those should be in there. Uh, they, they are... Uh, uh, Tweeted. Definitive advertising label with uh, with with no perforations in between. Um, so that one, you know, uh, some of them. Special house. It was. I think it was whoever. From what I could, what I, from what I recall, it was whatever they could. It was to generate some revenue, and uh, it, it was alcohol. It was. Uh, Singer is on there. I believe that's the sewing uh, sewing machine company or early early sewing machine company. There's there's quite a few of them. I don't unfortunately I don't know which one that Bianchera um, is uh, the Casa Special the Bianchera. I'm not sure which one that is up there. Um, but because they couldn't be used overseas, they were not very popular, and the contract was terminated in late 25. So basically, for one year, those stamps existed. Hence, and they weren't used very often. So they're. Do you see them separated, or they come? No, they're always together. I've never seen one with perforation. Um, or I think, thought maybe somebody cut it off, and you see a, a, a no perf on the bottom or something. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you'd ruin a pretty, pretty valuable stamp if you did that. If you took scissors to well, it. I make, I, this would have happened back in Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's pretty interesting to note that the United States companies were buying into Italian <clears throat> advertisement for stamps in this period because it was also Columbia Records. Oh, oh, that's right. Yeah, it was Columbia. That was one. Yes, yeah, I'm trying to remember singer sewing, singer sewing machines, and I can't remember what, bitter or Camp Campari, Campri. Yeah, that's Italian. That's Italian company. Yeah. Yeah, there's the cherries. And there's some sort of cherry. cherry company. Yeah, I can't remember what they all are, but you can look them up on eBay or on, on the internet, and you can probably find a picture of every single one of them mm -hmm. if you're interested in them. And that's, uh, and that's other the green is. Julius yeah, and then occasionally, so not always do you, you end up with definitives with a, a king on them, but you also end up with you know some of the historical figures that that uh, they want. So that one has Caesar on it, but.
but notice they still put the fasces in the bottom right corner, right and left corner there. And that's important to note because later in Italian stamp, the fasces get removed and the exact same stamp is issued. So you need to collect it both. If you want to collect Italy, you collect it both ways. And so at first it took Steve and I a little while to catch on to what we were looking at. Like, what do they mean? Yeah. And then some of them are hard to find without the fasces. You'll find them all day long with, but hardly without. Let's talk a little bit about commemorative stamps. Um, I'm going to pass out uh, the sheet, and we talked a little bit um, earlier about Giribaldi, and I've got the set of uh, the 50th anniversary of the, the uh, War of Thousands. And uh, on here, it's the second row down. They're green, green, red, red, green down there. And there's just also some other interesting uh, commemorative <coughs> stamps on there. <coughs> um, so the top left one there is uh, Alessandro Manzoni. It's a set of six. And he was a poet and a novelist from 1785 to 1873. And He's most famous for his novel, The Betrothed. It's considered uh, a masterpiece of world literature. I can't say because I haven't read it, but <laughs> apparently it is. But the Italians are very, very proud of, of Manzoni. Is that his residence or is that something from that is history? That is his residence, his home in Milan. Okay. Uh, that's a picture of his home in Milan. The, the series is uh, the first four stamps of that series are images from his novel, so scenes depicting that, that are depicted in his novel. That one is his residence, and then the, there's a picture later of the five lira, which is the high denomination, and that, that is a picture of him. And the um, street that we uh, had our hotel on one of the major boulevards is in Manzoni. Yeah, yeah, like I said, his, he's a very, yeah, he's very, very uh, revered in Italy. Um, let's see, we've got, oh, the bottom left one there, the, the 1226 to 1926, that uh, was issued in January 30th, 1926, to commemorate the 700th anniversary of the death of St. Francis of Assisi. So a lot of the times you'll also see, you know, some uh, religious type commemorative stamps in Italy. There's quite a few of them. Uh, the one, the purple one in the top center, black, purple, um, that's Alessandro Volta. Uh, and from, he, was, he lived from 1745 to 1827. And he was an Italian physicist from Como. And he's known for his 19th century, century invention, the electrochemical cell or battery. He invented the battery. And it's where we get the name volt from or voltage from Volta. He was also the discoverer of methane. He discovered methane, which is really, I didn't know. <laughs> so that's pretty interesting. It's kind of obvious with Volt on there, you're kind of, oh, Volt's, wonder if that has something to do with it. But yeah, so that was, that was kind of, that's kind of an interesting commemorative stamp. Um, and then the next one over, um, uh, the one, uh, the red one with the young person on it, uh, that was issued in 1932 in October, and that was to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the fascist government and the March on Rome. So remember, Mussolini did the, was there for the March on Rome. He becomes prime minister the year after, and then they issue this at the 10th anniversary. And this is a portrait of a fascist youth, and, um, and it's kind of interesting in 1932, uh, Commemorative stamps were only issued for three events in all of 1932, but they were such large sets. There's 56 stamps for those three issues. And I think that one itself has like, uh, what's 15 in it or something like that. So I have them all. You guys will be able to look at, at my collection. You can page through it, but I have that entire set and all the sets from the 30s. Um, and then the last one, or second to last one on the bottom there, the soccer one. Um, that was the second World Soccer Championship, also known as the 1934 FIFA World Cup or FIFA World Cup. 
and it was held in Italy from the 27th of May through the June 10th. And the games were played all over the country in Turin, Milan, Trieste, Genoa, Bologna, Florence, Rome, and Naples. So they had soccer games all over the country, but basically it was the second FIFA World Cup. Um, and Italians, you know, they're nuts for soccer. Absolutely crazy. And in the 80s, uh, and I think even today, they dominated soccer. They won the World Cup all the time, them in Brazil. Well, of course they call it football. Football, yeah, correct. But um, when we were there, one of the Italian teams won, and they, they played from like noon to 5 p.m. or something, uh -huh. and then they all came out of the stadium with flags and noisemakers, and they were out on the streets until midnight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yelling and screaming. <laughs> yeah, they're, it, soccer's a huge thing, oh, absolutely God. huge. So that's an issue that, that there's an issue of five that they issued in uh, for the World Cup there, and they've issued they issue plenty of others throughout the years in Italy for commemorative stamps. I still think it's funny though. There's the fasties there on the yeah. bottom right on the right hand side, <laughs> so they even put them on soccer commemorative stamps. So, and did uh, did anybody find the fasties on that airmail? You did. Yeah. Where is it? They're down on the horizontal air airmails. They're down on the either side of the cross of Savoy. Yeah, and there's a shadow of the 25, the red one, the 25 with the airplane, the shadow on the ground is a Fassies. Yeah. So I've got the impression from looking at uh, covers that these commemorators weren't necessarily used all that much. Correct. So stamps in general, especially that time, and I'll talk about that too when I when I talk about stamps I had to seek out because I'm going to talk about the challenges of collecting usually a little bit. Um, those stamps, they um, there were a lot of favorite cancels that were put on stamps, um, but especially higher denomination stamps, it was very rare to find. It's very rare to find them postally used. And, and I'll show you a picture of what, because typically what will happen in, in 19, like in 1934 when they issued those huge sets, they go way up to five lira or they turn into semi-postals. The top three issues are also, are, are kind of a semi-postal stamp. You're paying a premium. People didn't use those very much. They were pretty expensive. So you'll find a mint. So unfortunately, when you collect it, you can do one of two things. You can either get them the entire set mint or you can get it used and then your last three are probably going to be mint and if you're buying them used it's either it's more than likely a favor cancel or a forged cancel on them because the price is astronomical i mean it, it uh, uh the stamp i think i've got some examples on the prices but it's just crazy what a used one is worth versus a mint one um and then the last stamp on the right there was uh, Andrea A Antonio Stradivari. We all know who that is from 1644 to 1737, and he made stringed instruments. You know, he made violins, cellos, guitars, violas, and harps. Um, we all know he's considered probably the greatest artisan in his field. Um, it's this I thought was interesting when I was doing the research. It's estimated that he made 1,100 instruments in his lifetime and that 650 of these still survive, and 500 of them are violins. And we had a little presentation on him. Uh huh. Nobody can figure out how he did it, and you know, the, the process. Yeah. Everything was secret. And, was, <laughs> and nobody can make a violin as sweet as him. As him, yeah. Even today. Uh, CBS at 5 o'clock when I wake up. Had a special this morning on the Stradivarius. Oh, that's funny. On the auction block Wednesday, nothing under eighteen million. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The interesting bit. Yeah. yeah. So you can collect a stamp and uh, have a piece of history. Um, oh, I think my computer. There we go. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, propaganda stamps. We're going to talk a little bit about propaganda stamps. And I'm going to pass out a couple things. I'm going to pass out an Italian East <coughs> Africa set um, from Italy. Uh, it's from 1941. And I think you'll see there's symbology and people on it. <laughs> I think it's pretty obvious who it is. 
Um, and then I'm going to pass out this. These are stamps that are generally unlisted in the catalog, um, but highly collectible. If you have specialized on the back, uh, there's a bunch of Fayum. You can ignore those, but basically on the front here, these single ones, they're Italian stamps that have been overprinted. Uh, I'm sure some of them could or probably are forged um, because some of them are quite valuable. But it's just interesting seeing all the little different uh, overprints that exist on some of the Italian stamps. Um, and again, that's, that's some more propaganda stamps that, that uh, exist. So on these stamps here in particular, you see in 1941-42, there's a strong relationship between the axis and so, of course, Italy's got a, you know, Mussolini probably had a hand in it, but uh, they got to issue some stamps showing the Axis leaders on it. So there's Hitler and Mussolini. And the interesting thing is on the top stamp, it's more of a civilian profile. Uh, you know, they're dressed in civilian clothes. And then in the, uh, second, the second half of the series, the other stamps in the same series on the bottom, that's their military uniform. So I thought it was kind of interesting that there was a contrast there between the way they issued the stamps. And then uh, the other set there, which is, there's a whole set of 12 of them, but that's only four of them. They just come in three different colors and, and denominations. But that brown set there um, is another set of propaganda stamps, this time with the king on it. Um, and there's, there's four stamps. The top left one means victory for the axis. That's the phrasing on the right-hand side. The top right one is discipline is the weapon of victory. And the bottom left with the airplanes, that's every, everything and everyone for victory. And then the bottom right one is arms and hearts must be stretched out towards the goal. So there, that's some hardcore propaganda stamps there. That's Victor Emmanuel. Yeah, that's Victor Emmanuel uh, the third, who reigned from four, 1900 to 1946 on there. And they got the Fassi up there. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The Fassi's is on there, and yeah, yeah. I mean, it's you know, and the other thing is, notice they use battleships and bombers and artillery, and they're trying to project strength, and you know, because these stamps were leaving the country. And they're trying to project, you know, we're powerful, we're almighty Italy, and we're united with Germany. So what we learned from our guide and other people is the Italian Army, Navy, Air Force, etc. didn't like Germany at all, but they had to do it because mm -hmm. Germany was running the show. Mm -hmm. and as soon as Germany started falling apart, they immediately gave up and let the Americans come in. They did, yeah. Um, next one here, we'll talk a little bit about the South Italian Socialist Republic. Um, so that that's a really interesting story because, um, and, and it kind of go what on Dennis said, so they're in the north of Italy, basically north of uh, the hills in central Italy, north of, uh, north of Rome. Um, they saw, the king saw that Italy, you know, was going to get invaded or was being mm -hmm. invaded and, you know, was trying to decide, did he really want to stay in alliance? Do they really want to stay in alliance with Germany or not? So what they did is um, what happened in Italy was the, the allies came in from the south and almost immediately or right before that happened, the Victor Emmanuel ceased ties with Germany and basically arrested Mussolini and stuck him in the, in the mountains. I'm trying to remember the name of the city. Stuck him in the in the mountains in central Italy. There's a ski resort there now, and had him under guard. And um, and what happened is the uh, the Germans came in like within a couple days. The paratroopers came in and paratrooped in there. Took 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 no took Mussolini to the north to be with hit to be closer to Germany because Hitler. 
Yeah. Let's say taking him out, like killing him. Yeah, to get him out of the country (laughs) because he was under arrest. And so basically they they got him out of jail, so to speak, and took him to northern Italy um, and uh, and southern Italy immediately just uh, just became part of the Axis and just let the Axis or the Allies, sorry, the Allies, and basically from Sicily up, just let the Allies run up to to near Rome, and and so very short period of time, Italy became completely divided um, between the Axis and, and the Allies, and. Um, so Mussolini still retained some power for a few years up north uh, till the end of the war, and Germany was really funding everything that was going on up there. You know, uh, northern Italy is very different than southern Italy. Um, all the monetary wealth was there. All a lot of the business of Italy was there. A lot of the valuable commodities in Italy existed up north. And there's still sort of in Italy today. There's still sort of this uh, this mentality of have and have nots. That northern Italy has everything, and southern Italy got the short end of the stick or doesn't have anything. And uh, you see more affluence up north. Um, you see heavy manufacturing up north. Heavy manufacturing. The lines. Yeah. yeah. The other thing you see in northern Italy is it's cleaner in northern Italy than it is in southern Italy. The further south in Italy you go, the dirtier it gets, which is kind of interesting. Um, So on the stamps there, again, they took Italian stamps and overprinted them with fasces in red. Uh, Then there was a GNR overprint, and... They were found on the 29, 1929 to 1942 definitive airmail, special delivery, uh, and war propaganda stamps of Italy. So that last war propaganda stamp uh, set I showed you, and then airmail, special delivery, and definitive. They overprinted GNR, and it stands for Guardia Nazionale Repubblicana which is National Republican Guard. That's basically the Mussolini's army. Is, is what, that's what became Mussolini's army. And uh, it was, it was uh, the military arm of the fascist party. And they were created uh, in December of, uh, on the 8th of December, 1943. So the GNR overprint appears after late 1943. Um, and then they also issued some stamps. You know, they actually printed their own stamps. Again, funded more than likely by Germany or in in uh, with the approval of Germany. Because really, you know, Mussolini was a figurehead. Germany had all the power. They were telling he was telling Mussolini what to do in northern Italy. Um, and so, uh, so they issued some. Uh, some of those uh, Republica Sociale Italiana stamps, and there's a whole section in the catalog for just uh, Socialist Italy stamps from that period. Um, and then, basically, in 1946, uh, we talked a little bit about the Republic of Italy appeared, um, which is where you see. Uh, uh, Republica Italiana first show up and Posta Italiana shows up and those are all stamps uh, after 1946. It was kind of a controversial thing in 1946. It was a referendum and there was voting and there was lots of accusations of fraud and ballot stuffing especially by the the kingdom, the kings. They didn't want to lose power. Um, and if I recall the the it was a pretty slim majority. It was like 54% or something voted for the Republic. So there's questions of whether what happened. But what was behind it all was the Allies because they wanted to see a Republic in Italy. They wanted to see, they figured the kings and the monarchs were part of the problems that Italy had had over the last 50, 50 plus years. And so, you know, that's, that's why they took a lot of the power or had talked the king into giving up a lot of his power because this is, was their ultimate goal, was to have a referendum and have it run by the people. And so that's when a president was first installed in Italy. So what they, they've had like a hundred and so on governments or something. 
Yeah, the Giants that can't keep a gun. So yeah. So let's see. Oh, no. Here you go. Here is your diagram. Yeah. yeah. So what I'm going to hand out here is I'm going to hand a stack out to you guys while we go over the next stamps. What I did is I took, um, well, first I'll hand out this one, and then we'll go into the other ones. This one I'm going to hand out. We're going to go, oh, yeah, that's, I threw this in, just not that you should read it, but it just shows how complicated Italy's, Put come, becoming a republic was. I mean, there's all these different, there's fascist Italy, there's Austrian occupation, there's Trieste, which is in northeastern Italy, there's Sicily and the AMG occupation, there's different zones of Trieste and Yugoslav, some of it went to Yugoslavia, there's the Vatican City was created during the time. This is just, I thought this was interesting. Um, to note on there, the S is, for each S next to the box, that means a stamp was issued by that entity. So the stamps exist. And the B is, the person who put this up there had a B in there, they issued banknotes. So there's money from those country, from those entities. So if you look down, down on the bottom right, uh, or bottom right here in the free territory of Trieste, there was stamps and banknotes, but for Italy AMG occupation in 47, there was only banknotes, but in 43, there were stamps in Sicily. So it's just, it's really interesting. Again, I, I just threw that in there just to show you, kind of give you guys a sense of how complicated Italy's history was. The other thing I stumbled across... Thank you.